BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello, I'm Tina Dahili and this is Beyond Today, where we ask one big question about one big story. Today, what do we get wrong about female terrorists? As Islamic State falls, one British teenager has emerged from the last IS stronghold in Syria. You'll probably already know her name, Shamima Begum. And four years ago, at the age of 15, she ran away from home in East London to marry an Islamic State fighter in Syria. Well, now Shamima's 19, has just given birth in a refugee camp and wants to come home. This is what she had to say when the BBC's Quentin Somerville spoke to her in Syria. Myself, yeah, I will admit I was the one that made the choice. <coughs> Even though I was only 15 years old, I did have, I, I do have, like, I, c I could make my own decisions back there. I do have the, the, like, mentality to make my own decisions and I did leave on my own, knowing that <coughs> it was a risk, but, yeah, I will admit it's my fault right now. I just want... I just want forgiveness, really, from the UK. Now, whether you believe she's truly sorry or not, whether you think she should be allowed home or not, there's no doubt that she sent the media into a complete frenzy. But when we focus on just one woman, one teenager, in the entire story of IS, do we miss the point and overlook the bigger picture? I've been speaking to Daniel De Simone, who works in the BBC's Home Affairs team, and in his work, he's come across plenty of women who've been involved in terrorist activity. And what you're going to hear is some pretty shocking recordings that he shared with us. There are other girls like Shamima. Yesterday in the House of Commons, the Home Secretary said that 900 people from Britain have travelled to take part in the conflict in Syria and Iraq. And he said that about 40%, so say 360, have come back. About the same number are still over there and the rest, so about 20%, are known to have died. So why are we so obsessed with this girl, Shamima? I think she became a sort of a symbol of what was going on when all these hundreds of people were going over there because of her age, the fact that she went over there with two friends of the same age. And the fact that she was a symbol then means the fact that she's been discovered so many years later over there and she's spoken so freely to the media is why so many people are interested in this and why it's received so much coverage. There have obviously been a lot of other people who've gone over there and we've sometimes found out what's happened to them later, but it hasn't been such a sensational thing. Like I said, the poster girl thing was not my choice. I would not have, you know, done that. But. Me, me just going there and being a housewife and just sitting at home and them taking care of me is not really in any way helping. Like, I'm not paying for their bullets. I'm not paying for them to be trained or anything. There's clearly an issue with that ideology living on, even if the physical territory of IS is gone. How do we deal with that going forward? Well, the, the ideology won't die with the loss of the territory. And the Islamic State group isn't the only extremist group, Al-Qaeda is, is still there, is another group, there were plenty of others. There was a case involving a family, it was a mother and two daughters who were all convicted of terrorism offences. The two daughters at different times wanted to go to Syria, one of them was eventually convicted of trying to go to Syria, and one of them, Safa Bular, who was 18 when she was convicted, she was somewhat younger when she was committing the offences. She actually married an Islamic State fighter online and then they were communicating. And the evidence was that she wanted to go and join him in Syria. She was prevented from doing that by the authorities and she then sort of turns her attention to planning an attack in the UK. But, but surely not on her own, that direction, the help and planning must have come from somewhere. Well, she was in contact with her husband, this guy who was from Coventry originally, who was killed in a drone strike and he was much older than her. But certainly the actual family, so you had a mother and the, and the two daughters, the police sort of said they couldn't find a controlling mind, as they put it, so it wasn't that there was someone was directing them. 
And when they, the mother and the older sister were arrested, there were several men arrested at the same time. And I remember when it happened because the older sister, Riz Lane Bular, was, was shot in a police raid when they kind of went in because they were so concerned about her, her plotting. I remember we covered it at the time we went up there and there was probably a, a sense in which, well, it's, you know, men probably plotting and then there's women there, you know, which is frankly a bit of a sexist thing to think because, you know, you're assuming that the women aren't... Someone else must be controlling quite, or directing exactly. them. And, and, and actually, you know, no men were charged. And in that case, there were four women who were charged. There was a three family members. There was a, a friend, a female friend, and they were all convicted. And, of course, there were men around them who they knew. But the fact is it was an all female terror plot and they didn't certainly didn't need any men to tell them what to do or to be involved in order for them to, to do that. So Safa Bular was charged with planning to travel to Syria and held on remand and what she wasn't yet charged with at that time was planning an attack of her own in the UK I and mean, she would later be charged with that but, but what happened when she was held on remand is this her own UK attack plan if you like, the baton was passed to her sister, Rizlaine Bular, and they actually spoke about it on the phone, and Safa Bular was in Medway in prison, and she was talking to her sister, Rizlaine Bular. Don't, don't worry, alhamdulillah, you don't worry. Stay strong, you're going to be fine, inshallah. Yeah, I know, but... Basically, yeah. You know, uh, no, I, I was speaking to her on the phone, yeah. and uh, uh, you know the party that I wanted to have? Yeah. She 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 knows uh she knows a few recipes for some amazing cakes. Yeah. Um. So like hopefully we can uh, you know like have it like really fancy mob, like proper like English tea party kind of thing. Yeah. Are you going to wear Moroccan or? No, I'm gonna. I think like everybody should wear like little. I want it to be like an English tea party kind of thing. So like with little tea cups and tea cakes and stuff. Alice in Wonderland theme. Oh. Yeah, maybe Alice in Wonderland theme. Yeah. That would be funny. Oh, you can be the Mad Hatter because your hair is crazy. Which is a bit funny. Mm. You can have cucumber and butter sandwiches. And they were talking in code, and they referred to uh, a tea party, and that was their code for an attack. Um. Uh. I. I. I didn't. Basically, I don't want your mum to feel bad that she's not invited to the party. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, it's going to be me and, you know, like three sisters and stuff. We're just going to have fun. Um, it's going to basically be like, it's going to be like basically like a tea uh, party and stuff. With cake. And huh? what sisters do you know, though? Like, who's good at preparing like cakes and dresses and stuff like that? Don't worry, I'll give you feedback after a shot of life. It's going to be fun. Um, it's going to be on, um, on, on Thursday. We're going to have a party. This Thursday? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. You came to us initially on Beyond Today with the story of another girl. Can you tell us about that? She was 16 when she went over there. And this case had less coverage in the media. She went over in... August 2014, she sort of left in the middle of the night from her family home in Fleet in Hampshire. She was one of, I think, 10 siblings, family of parents from Bangladeshi heritage. And she made her way to Syria and eventually got in contact with some of her family, like via apps and things on, online. And at first, the authorities didn't know that she'd gone over there. They discovered it somewhat later. And she was communicating with her family and once the police became aware of it, they approached the family and they were aware of some of the communications. So the family were in contact with the police. And the police said to the family that whatever you do, don't send her any money because you will be potentially committing a, a terrorist offence, like funding terrorism, which some people have been charged with for sending money to people who have gone over there. And, you know, at first they didn't. And the evidence in the case against her brother was that the family were very against Islamic State, were telling her what they're doing is wrong and she would defend it and she would defend what was happening out there. One brother sort of, she was asking him for money and he refused and told her, you know, there's just no way. She then turned her attention to another brother who was, it was put in court that he was sort of somewhat suggestible. He at first also said, 
I'm not giving you any money, you know, you've already ruined our lives and then you want to ruin it further. She would talk about life in Islamic State. She would try and defend Islamic State. So on the one hand, she would say things like, well, you know, I hear all this bad stuff about us, but um, it's not true. But then you'd have like a voice message that she'd send where she would talk about actually going and watching the stoning of, of women publicly and, and be excited about that. Guess what, yeah? Today there's going to be a stoning of a woman. Uh, me and my husband are going to go see it, inshallah. So cool, man! Nothing is better than being under the law of Allah. This is the Sharia. Yeah. What are you saying? That the man-made law is better? You know, this is kufr. Kufar are ruling you, huh? In the time of Prophet Sallam, the kufar, do you think the Muslims lived under the kufar? They had honour, they had more honour than this. They lived under Islam. But eventually, he did. He kind of took steps to send us $3,000 and it was discovered. And he was eventually charged and then convicted of funding terrorism. But, you know, he, there was, everyone said that he was not remotely sympathetic to Islamic State. He only sent her the money because he was concerned about her and her baby. She was very manipulative and you could see that in the messages. And manipulating him and, and in the end he's the one that's going to prison, you know, has gone to prison. It's really a tragic case. But as far as we know, she was certainly alive within the last few months in Syria. When you do see extremist cases, the women who are involved in a lot of these cases are, are no less radical than the men and are, in some cases are often the most radical person. And that probably doesn't fit with what most people's ideas and expectations will be, but, you know, you do see it quite often. It, you know, it's, it's frankly a bit sexist to assume that everyone is being manipulated. Joanna Cook and Gina Vale are from the Department of War Studies at King's College London. They've written extensively on the role of women in ISIS. The fact that stories like Shamima's are hitting the headlines is because she is a woman now and a young girl at the time. If she was a man, I don't think that we would necessarily get the same level of media coverage as we have in this instance. It's very difficult to tell what her motivations were. Looking at her footprint on social media, she definitely didn't go out to be a poster girl within IS's own propaganda, and she wasn't. She didn't feature within IS propaganda. Women didn't. But there's no doubt that IS recruitment definitely capitalised on international media, and in some cases international media does the job for them. By launching profiles such as Shamima's into the stratosphere of international media, it gains momentum on people asking questions of, so what is Islamic State? Why does a young woman want to go? What are they offering? And anyone that may be potentially vulnerable to Islamic State's promises and, and their appeal, if they are then starting to ask those questions because of international media's hype of certain profiles, then yes, she has become a poster girl. But whether she set out to be that way is another thing. The role of women in not only supporting terrorist organisations ideologically, physically as well, sometimes in combative format, is very much underestimated. Women are constantly overlooked at their value. Either that or the total opposite end of the scale when they're then fetishised. And what we're seeing at the moment with the case of Shamima is the fact that this is one individual woman that wants to come back is hitting the headlines because she's a woman. The fact that she's saying she has no regrets for joining and that she's named her son after a genocidal leader and that she wanted him to become an ISIS fighter. If a man said that, it wouldn't hit the headlines in the same way. It would definitely cause a stir and it would stir up public debate. But the fact that she's a woman, it hits a nerve with what we understand as femininity and womanhood, and it goes against the grain. And that's what's so fascinating for me. She just happens to be the first of what are going to be many, many cases of other women with such complex circumstances now coming out of this territory. The kind of complexities in her case are very much representative of the kind of complexities we're going to see with the thousands of other women that we are now dealing with in this space. What were the factors that pushed them out of their life and pulled them towards the so-called Islamic State? 
did they feel like they were being discriminated against at home? Did they feel like their life was boring and they needed, they had a sense of adventure they wanted to go fulfill over there? What was it that pushed them out of their environment? And what element of ISIS propaganda or element of the caliphate that they were presenting pulled them towards that? There was a lot of evidence that we could find through social media, whether that's through Twitter, Ask FM, Kick, Facebook, blog posts such as Bird of Jannah. One case, for example, is a young girl from Indonesia. She was 17 and she was solely the main catalyst for 26 members of her family emigrating to Syria to join Islamic State. She mentioned for herself that she wanted to fulfill her career in nursing. Her younger sister wanted to continue education with computer science. They wanted to clear all family debts and then the whole family's will to live under Islamic law. That's one side. Then you have other women who quite simply want to find a husband that they feel is ideologically the most pure epitome of manhood that they could find in a husband, raise jihadi children in the way that they want to. So they're very much individual aspects. So one case in particular is Sally Ann Jones. She's such an interesting case. I mean, she was in her 40s. She was a former rock pop princess sex drugs rock and roll were part of her identity and then she converted to islam and made the move to islamic state she made it very clear that she herself had aspirations to be violent on behalf of islamic state she said that she wanted to be the first western woman or at least the first woman to behead a western prisoner and this obviously didn't happen. Islamic State made it very clear that women were not allowed to take part as executioners. And in fact, in 99% of IS propaganda, women's images are blurred out. So they're not even allowed to feature in IS propaganda. But instead, because she couldn't do it, she offered her son to conduct that execution. And he was one of five boys in a video that shot prisoners. He was about 12 at the time. Joanna and Gina believe that understanding why the ideology attracted girls and women in the first place is the only way to tackle it. We know that in terms of hate crimes in the UK, if these are targeted towards Muslims, the first people that tend to be the victims of these are going to be women that are wearing visible religious symbols. If they're wearing a hijab, if they're wearing a niqab, we know statistically that they tend to face the brunts of things like hate crimes. So the kind of lived experience in this climate, and that's going to certainly impact on things like feelings of identity, feelings of belonging, what kind of messages these organizations put out that resonate with them more. We also have to recognize that women can be absolutely imperative parts of the solution. We're talking about 41,000 individuals from around the world that went to join the so-called Islamic State. And this doesn't even start accounting for the thousands of individuals that have been impacted locally by this organization. We're going to be dealing with this issue for generations to come. <laughs>